Welcome back to the channel guys. As I recently discussed in my Pokemon Arceus video, the Pokemon series has the stigma of games being too samey, ignoring spin-off titles and some of the more important aspects introduced into the series with each gen, like breeding, holding items, or abilities. The core of the series has remained the same old capturing monsters and engaging in turn-based battles. The Digimon series, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. Games being so different from each other, you kind of have to wonder if they're actually sequels. And there's no better example than the second game on the PS1, Digimon World 2. As I discussed in my review of the first game, go watch that video by the way, the series began as more of a pet raising sim with some action RPG elements. The game had your playable characters sucked into the digital world and tasked with returning the former residents of File City back home. The core gameplay consisted of raising your Digimon by feeding them, training them, taking them to the bathroom, and making sure they'd get a good night's sleep. How well you took care of your Digimon would determine how long it lived, how well it did in battle, and what Digimon it would ultimately digivolve into. Gameplay took place in real time, so outside of pressing the pause button, you didn't get much time to think and react in battle with enemy Digimon. While I do enjoy the game quite a lot, it's so obtuse when it comes to how to raise your Digimon properly, what it will digivolve into, and what does and doesn't count as care mistakes. Ultimately, that makes it a very beginner unfriendly game. So a strategy guide was pretty much a requirement to figure it out. And even then, it was still very easy to screw up. Now most sequels tend to go out of their way to fix problems like that. Either by offering better tutorials, making certain mechanics a lot easier, or shit, just getting rid of what didn't work. Digimon World 2 takes a rather different approach to addressing these issues, and that's to change just about everything from the first game. If Digimon World 1 could be best summed up as a pet raising action RPG, Digimon World 2 is a roguelike, dungeon crawling, turn based RPG. Yes, really. There's a lot new in this game to cover. Some of it's better than the first game, and some of it a lot worse. But before we get started, hit that subscribe button if you're new to the channel, and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Now let's get into it. The setup for the game is much different than the first. In the sequel, you now play as a rookie guard tamer who lives in the human settlement of Digital City. He starts the game following his mentor, Zutacorn your playable character now on his final training mission before he can become a guard tamer for real. Guard tamers protect the city from wild Digimon, using their own team of Digimon to venture out into domains and defeating the boss Digimon who control these domains. Apparently humans have lived in the digital world for several decades now, having lived side by side with some peace-loving Digimon and fighting against evil or wild Digimon. It's not really spelled out if this game takes place in the same world as the first game, there are some hints and references to the file continent where it took place, but nothing is really confirmed. Right off the bat, the sequel fixes one of my bigger complaints with the first game, mainly that you now have a tutorial to explain the game's mechanics. You'll start off in Zutacorn's Digi Beetle, which is essentially a personal tank that allows guard tamers to travel through the domains of wild Digimon. Domains are dungeons, made up of several floors with Digimon, traps, obstacles, and treasure chests scattered around them. Most domain floors are randomized, so return trips to a domain tend to be very different from each other, for better or for worse. Though it's not as in-depth as a modern roguelike game, as domains tend to cycle through the same handful of floor plans, though they will change up the layout of certain traps, obstacles, and where your Digibeetle starts on a floor. To ascend a floor, you'll have to find the exit somewhere on the current floor, Depending on how the RNG gods bless you, you could start right next to it, or on the other side of the map. Now, you'd think at most the only thing you would lose is your time and patience if you end up far from the exit, but that's not the case. Your Digi Beetle has its own health and energy that it uses. Every step in the dungeon will use up more and more energy, and if you run out before you beat the boss Digimon of the domain, you'll be transported out of the level, and have to restart the whole thing all over again. Ditto if you take too much damage from traps and bugs, and your Digi Beetle's health hits zero. Oh, and you can't save once you're in a domain, so there's no save scumming if you screw up. 
The game isn't merciless though, as after the tutorial and receiving your own Digi Beetle, you'll be able to upgrade its stats and buy better parts for it, assuming you have the money to afford it. Since I brought them up a few times now, might as well explain what the various hazards you'll encounter in dungeons are. First are landmines. Depending on the type of radar you have equipped, some of these are basically invisible, damaging your Digi Beetle in random ways, taking off your health, making you unable to move straight for a while, disabling a part on the Digi Beetle like your radar, the item shooter, the missile shooter, or your actual vision. Yeah, you could end up walking through an entire domain completely in the dark if you're unlucky. Luckily, having the right radar and arm equipped will let you spot them so you can avoid driving over them, or just disable them completely. Next are blocks, which are the most harmless. Just a large stone block that will prevent you from moving forward, either needing you to go the long way around it, or making use of drill missiles to destroy them. Similar to blocks are electrospores. They serve the same purpose of blocking your path, but can damage you if you run into them and like the landmines, can be invisible as well. They need their own special type of ammo to destroy. Acid is the next hazard. Its intensity signified by what color it is. It'll sap away at your Digi Beetle's health as you drive over it, but having the right tires equipped it ignores the issue. Next are treasure chests. Just about every chest you'll encounter later on will be booby trapped, which similar to landmines can end up damaging the Digi Beetle, its parts, or even your own Digimon. Again, the right part will help you disable the trap, but there's always a slim chance that it won't work, or worse, that the chest was empty. And finally, the absolute worst trap you'll encounter? Bugs. Bugs combine the worst aspects of the other traps. Being invisible without the right radar, blocking important passages, and needing special ammo to destroy, but with some new effects being thrown in. Bugs can drain your energy at a rapid rate, drain your money, take up space on your beetle so you can't recruit Digimon, and worst of all, send your Digimon back to the server in Digital City. This is absolutely the worst, as it can make a relatively easy dungeon into a nightmare, especially at higher levels where most encounters involve three Digimon at a time, not to mention that the domains will have more floors the deeper you get into the game. Thankfully, they don't start popping up till several hours into the game, but it's still easy to get blindsided by them before you can prepare. Finally, the last two things of note about domains are boss floors and element tiles. Boss floors are self-explanatory. Floors with a green, matrix-like wall that the boss Digimon of the domain sits on. Element tiles are non-harmful tiles that will buff Digimon of a certain type when standing on it, with almost all bosses standing on floor tiles that will buff them. But enough about the dungeon crawling, let's talk about the actual Digimon. The game has completely dropped all the pet raising aspects of the first game, Instead, acting more like a traditional monster-catching JRPG in the vein of Pokémon. After completing the tutorial level, you'll get to choose a guard team to join in town. The Golden Hawks that start you with the Vexine type and our old friend Agumon. The Blue Falcons that start you with the Data type Patamon. And finally, the Black Swords, who start you with the Virus type Demi Devamon. Like the last game, it keeps the same triangle of strengths and weaknesses with virus types weak to vaccine types, vaccine weak to data, and data weak to virus. Along with being split further with each Digimon belonging to an element, either fire, water, nature, machine, or darkness. The Digimon stages have changed, with Rookie being the lowest level this time, ditching baby and in-training Digimon, but now bringing in Megas. Unlike the first game, because there's no time system here, your Digimon will Digivolve when they hit a certain level. Being able to Digivolve from Rookie to Champion at level 11, Champion to Ultimate at level 21, and Ultimate to Mega at level 31. Leveling up is different than what you're used to. It's not as simple as just regular level grinding. At a certain point, your Digimon will stop gaining XP and hit a level cap. In order for them to continue leveling up, you'll now have to perform DNA Digivolution. I'm 
unfortunately, it's not as cool as the anime. Instead of combining two Digimon to get a stronger Digimon of a higher stage, it works more like breeding in the Dragon Quest Monster games. The two parent Digimon combine their data to create a new Digimon at a lower stage and level. The new child has their level cap increased, his base stats raised, his DP or Digivol points increased, along with inheriting the moves of its parents. Digivol points determine who your Digimon will Digivolve into, limited by its species and type. Much simpler compared to the first game's requirements for Digivolution. So in order to really build up a strong team, or just get the Digimon you want, you'll have to hit the level cap with your Digimon, DNA Digivolve them, raise them up again, and then DNA Digivolve again. Over and over again. Needless to say, this loop is very annoying, as it tends to slow down your progress constantly in order to keep growing your team. Thankfully, you're not limited to just using one Digimon in battle, now being able to use three, and any extra Digimon you befriend waiting on the city server. Similar to how Pokemon uses its box system. Capturing more Digimon is a little different than Pokemon though. When on the field, you have the option to highlight and shoot gifts at a Digimon. Gifts can be bought at your respective guards team's headquarters, and will only be effective on the type your guard team uses, though later into the game you'll get the chance to buy gifts for the other types. Shooting gifts will cause a heart to appear over their heads, slowly growing bigger the better the gift you give them, or the more gifts you give them, just like dating. Once you engage them in a fight, the last Digimon you knock out has a chance to join your team. While the capturing is fairly straightforward, I consider it very annoying in comparison to Pokemon, as capturing Digimon can still be very luck based, as depending on the room's layout, you may not get enough chances to fire gifts at them. Not only that, but there's no guarantee it'll work either. There are plenty of times where even with a large heart, a Digimon may not join you at the end of the battle. Pair that with the inability to save in dungeons, you either just wasted your items, or have to reload your save and try again. This is going to happen. A lot. Outside of befriending them in the wild, you can also get Digimon at the Digimon Center in the city. It's just like the trade NPCs in Pokemon, who will offer you one Digimon in exchange for another, and they serve more or less the same function as a crutch for the player, giving you a decent Digimon for a somewhat easy to catch one. The Wizardmon you get for Crabmon being a good example, as its Thunderball move is pretty solid and you're trading a rookie for a champion. Though, depending on what guard team you're on, you might be locked out of trading until you can get more varied gift items. Now what are the battles like? When you engage a Digimon in battle, you'll be taken to a separate screen where all your Digimon will engage the enemies. Digimon will take turns attacking each other, priority based on their speed stat, and it's a fairly standard back and forth between them. And in a nice little touch, the Digimon actually voice their moves. Though it's only one voice clip per move, so you'll get situations where your champion or ultimate sounds like a kid when they're using a weaker move. The techniques they use are divided up into four types. Attack, which does some damage and can come with an effect like causing poison, paralysis, confusion, draining an opponent's MP, or just debuffing one of their stats. Counter, which lets a Digimon instantly counterattack after being hit. Interrupt, which allows you to attack a Digimon just before they attack you. And finally, Assist, which will support the party in some way, like healing them, buffing their stats, changing the element of one of their attacks, or just debuffing an enemy. Having a good variety of attacks between your Digimon is essential to surviving tough encounters, especially later on when enemy Digimon will abuse debuffs and status effects. Learning moves is fairly standard too, usually learning a move one level after Digivolving, and like I brought up before, passing down their moves when using DNA Digivolution. Much easier than the first game, where your Digimon could only learn new moves after watching another Digimon use it. And even then, it only worked if they had a high enough brain stat, and could use the move in the first place. You'll also have the option to use items in battle, either healing your Digimon, buffing them, reviving them, or debuffing enemies. And it doesn't waste a turn either, which is a nice plus. Like my review of the first game, I don't know a good place to put this, but I really like the music in this game too. It's not as calming or atmospheric, but it's still pretty good, leaning towards a more digital and synthetic type of sound, and includes some real bangers. For example, this really fire track that plays during the tutorial boss.
the normal boss fight theme. The item shop theme that has a really catchy tune to it. And shit, even the saving screen sounds good. Regardless of the quality of the various games, they almost always seem to have a solid soundtrack. I briefly glanced over it at the beginning, but what's the exact story of Digimon World 2? Well, like the first game, there isn't much to it at first. After joining a guard team, the first few hours are really just your team leader sending you out to defeat boss Digimon. But there's not much character to these Digimon, and they don't really move the plot forward. Even as you meet more characters and some shenanigans take place in the city, again, nothing really happens. It's not until about 10 hours in, or more depending on how much you're grinding, that a plot starts to form. A group of evil tamers known as the Blood Knights have returned having apparently rebelled against the city 30 years ago. They're basically like Team Rocket, evil Digimon tamers who want to use Digimon for evil and take over the digital world. Though their reasons for returning after so long are shrouded in mystery. It may be that someone else is manipulating them behind the scenes. But I'll avoid talking about that and spoiling the end of the game. I guess you can call the story serviceable? In comparison to the first game, whose story didn't really exist, here it's just kind of drip-fed to you, with hours going by without much really happening at all. Add in the fact that there's a ton of padding in this game, chances are you'll forget what's going on. Which brings me to my main criticisms of this game. Despite being fairly neutral throughout this review, and returning to this game with fairly positive expectations, I ended up being very mixed about this game. And that's because of how insanely slow and grindy it is. Now understand, I'm someone who loves RPGs. And I've played some of the grindiest out there from different generations of gaming. And I've definitely played much grindier games than this. So normally the grind isn't a big deal for me. Especially with the amount of free time I have. But here it just seems slower and much more tedious. Mainly with how insanely slow battles are. And how your Digimon can only level up once per battle. Meaning, despite possibly getting a massive amount of XP for taking a weak Digimon into a high level battle, it could still take a bare minimum of 10 fights before your freshly DNA Digivolt partner can move up to the next stage. Add in some slow dungeon exploration, which can feel like an absolute crawl if you get bad RNG with floors. Along with lots of padding in the story, it just feels so unbearable at times. Now the padding in the story comes in the form of mandatory tournaments. At certain points throughout the game, before you can advance the story, your guard leader will tell you to get your tamer rank up to a certain level in order to take on tougher missions. While the fights aren't too bad at first, especially if you've DNA digivolved your team a few times, later on it gets tougher and tougher. Tamers in a tournament bringing in stronger teams, annoying strategies, and even having to fight your guard leaders at one point. And this is without the ability to use items in battle, your enemies starting off fresh each round, and all enemy Digimon having infinite MP. There will also be times where you're tasked with recruiting certain Digimon, which with the annoying way RNG can fail in recruiting in a dungeon, or just how long it could take to raise up a Digimon to Digivolve, again will eat up your time. I guess that's really my problem. This game just does not respect your time. So much of my footage was spent grinding the same floors over and over again in order to either level up my Digimon, or get money to upgrade the Digi Beetle. It really feels like the devs wanted to stretch out the length of this game as long as they could like other RPGs. But while other RPGs have a rich story to make up for it, engaging characters, or shit some fun side quests or unlockables, you don't find any of that here. This game just doesn't have enough substance. Shit, I gotta wonder what speedrunning this game is like. It's gotta be the biggest chore in the world. Sure, the first game had you grinding up your Digimon after it died, but because of its pet raising nature, you felt more connected and invested in your Digimon. Not only that, despite its non-existent story, 
you actually saw your accomplishments. Every Digimon defeated or recruited built up File City and added new things to the town, even adding things that would speed up raising a new Digimon. Not only that, but the world was colorful and fun to explore, with great music to go with it. Here, there's nothing to show your progress outside of the item shop getting updated. Every dungeon has the same bland look. Every fight looks exactly the same. The same music plays when exploring, only boss fights changing it up. Sometimes. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad game. It did do a lot of things right. First being much more player friendly, explaining the mechanics of the game and easing the player into the gameplay. Next, by making things simpler when it came to raising a Digimon. Sure, you lost the more personal aspects, but building a strong Digimon just comes down to standard RPG leveling as opposed to obtuse stat management in this game. That, and there isn't a real unwinnable situation. Your Digimon can't die permanently. You can revisit weaker dungeons to grind up your team to stronger levels. And despite how I may have framed it, it's not back-to-back -back grind walls either. If you put in the time to grow an ultimate Digimon, or hold on to the optional Metal Greymon you can catch, it's smooth sailing for a decent while. Especially if you have some moves that hit all opponents, or ones that lower their defense like Scissor Claw, or ones that do both. And despite how annoying having to DNA Digivolve over and over again to raise your level cap is, at the very least the game doesn't turn your two Megas into a rookie and expect you to grind all those stages up. I really walked into this game with nostalgia goggles, as I definitely enjoyed it more over the first game as a kid. As I've covered in both videos, I think a lot of it has to do with how tough the first game was as a kid. Here, I could reasonably get by without having to look up a guide and the goal was to just grind if I got stuck. Something that I'd already learned from other RPGs. Though thinking back on it, I don't think I beat this as a kid. And I'm starting to think I used GameShark to breeze through things like upgrading my DigiBeetle. To sum up my thoughts, Digimon World 2 is a strange sequel, bizarrely getting rid of both of what did and didn't work in the original game, lowering the barrier to entry, but making the gameplay painfully slow. Digimon World 2 feels like a half-step, like Bandai Namco still trying to figure out what they wanted to do with this series. The next game takes the better elements of this game, ups the difficulty, for better or for worse, but aping even more ideas from Pokemon. But that's a topic for another time. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, guys. Sorry if I sounded like I overhyped this one a bit in the previous videos. I purely forgot how much of a grind session this game would be. So it went from what I expected to be a more traditional retrospective, going over every part of the game, to more of a regular review. Assuming I release this one on time, I might be able to squeeze in another video this month. Not sure what I want to do to be honest, as Digimon World 2 was actually a replacement for a different game I wasn't sure I was ready to talk about. That, and after its failure last year, I did want to take another crack at Mega March and spend next month discussing Mega Man games. I still have a half-finished video from last year that I hope to clean up and use for next month, along with discussing a few more games. After March, there is a big project I want to work on, covering a series of games that I absolutely love, but I don't feel get enough recognition. I thought about turning it into some huge series retrospective, but I think I'll just do individual videos for each game, and then do a supercut somewhere down the line. Again, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and comment down below. Do you agree with my assessment that Digimon World 2 was too grindy? Or am I just being a whiny little bitch? Which game of the original trilogy is your favorite? Post down below. And finally, if you're new to the channel, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.